1982, 29-year-old Barbara Jo Oberholzer, who went by the nickname Bobby Jo, lived near the small ski town of Breckenridge, Colorado. She was an avid animal lover, very soft-spoken, and had moved from Wisconsin to Colorado because of her love for the mountains and animals in the state. Bobby Jo worked as a receptionist, and on January 6, 1982, she received a pay raise and went to celebrate with friends that evening at the Village Pub in Breckenridge. When she called her husband, Jeff, after 6 p.m. to let him know, he asked her if she wanted him to pick her up, but she said she already had a ride and would be home shortly. He then made dinner and waited for her to come home. It was common in 1982 to hitchhike around the Breckenridge area, something Bobby Jo did frequently. On this particular day, she had left home at 7.15 a.m., hitchhiked to work, and worked all day. So after a few drinks with friends, she was tired and ready to make the 16-mile trip home to Alma, where her husband Jeff and 11-year-old daughter were, but her friends were not ready to leave. So around 7.30 p.m., she told them she was going to hitchhike home and went to the nearby designated common area known for hitchhikers to wait for rides. Meanwhile, that same evening, 21-year-old Annette Schnee had a short break between her two jobs at the Holiday Inn in Frisco, where she cleaned rooms during the day, and at night she worked as a waitress at the Flipside Bar in Breckenridge. After high school, Annette spent a year at a modeling school in Nebraska known as Patricia Stevens College. She then decided that she wanted to become an airline attendant and was working her way to that dream. She was scheduled to be at work at 8 p.m. at the Flipside Bar and was seen about 5 p.m. leaving a pharmacy in Breckenridge and she had stopped to talk to an unidentified woman. It speculated that she likely planned to hitchhike home, which was only four miles away in Blue River. That night, Bobby Jo would not arrive home to her husband and daughter, and Annette would not arrive for her shift at 8 p.m. Although it's not believed that the two women were acquaintances, they both worked in Breckenridge, and like many people in the 80s and in the area, they often hitchhiked which they likely did this evening, but unknowingly got in the killer's vehicle and met their demise. The next day, Bobby Joe's driver's license was found by a rancher who called and notified Jeff. Soon after, Jeff and a friend began driving in that direction when they noticed a backpack in the distance off the road. Hours later, her body was found off US 285 in the snow on the summit of Hoosier Pass. She had been fatally shot and one wrist contained a pair of zip ties and it was determined that she had bled out and froze to death. Found nearby was a single orange sock and her keychain with a hook made for her by Jeff so it could be used as a self-defense weapon. This was strange because Bobby Jo was wearing both her socks. Jeff had found her backpack about 20 miles from the crime scene on US-285. Found inside was Bobby Joe's bloody glove and tissue that also contained blood. It was evident from the footprints in the fresh snow that she had likely broken free from her killer and was chased down and shot at close range. Her husband Jeff was the first person of interest in the case, not only because it was standard procedure, but because many found it strange that he was the person that located some of her belongings and touched and contaminated them. Soon after, it was learned that Annette had also gone missing the night before, same as Bobby Joe. About six months later, on July 3, 1983, a man and his nine-year-old son were fishing at Sacramento Creek when the boy found a fully clothed woman's body partially submerged. She had been fatally shot as well, but investigators could not locate a bullet. During the autopsy, something strange stuck out to the CBI agent attending the procedure. An orange sock on her left foot appeared to match the one found near Bobby Joe's body months earlier. A long striped sock was on her right foot, and the matching sock was found in the pocket of her sweatshirt. Annette's mother told the police that the orange socks belonged to her daughter. It speculated that Annette was killed first and one of her socks was left behind. Then when Bobby Joe was murdered hours later and dumped, the killer threw the matching sock out with her stuff. 
The investigators believed that the cases were obviously related. They desperately wanted to speak to the unidentified woman whom Annette was seen talking to outside the pharmacy right before she went missing, but she could never be located. Also, the location where Annette's body was discarded was in an area that likely only locals would know about. Therefore, they pulled a list of all local registered sex offenders and began attempting to rule them out one by one. A couple of months later, Annette's backpack was found along Highway 9. Strangely, inside was a business card from Jeff's repair business, along with a picture of an unknown man. The focus then centered on Bobby Joe's husband, Jeff, who was home in Alma the night his wife and Annette went missing, an alibi later verified. He stated that the reason she had his business card was that he had given her a ride in the past while she was hitchhiking. Years later, the blood found on Bobby Joe's glove and the bloody tissue was tested, and although it did belong to a man, it did not belong to her husband. After two lie detector tests that Jeff had taken and passed, along with his alibi and DNA test, it was finally determined that he was not their killer and the business card was merely a coincidence. After a DNA profile was created, many of the suspects in the case were ruled out. The DNA was entered into CODIS, but no matches were found. Meanwhile, one man remained at the top of their suspect list, Tom Luther. About six weeks after Bobby Joe and Annette disappeared, Luther was arrested for a brutal physical and sexual attack on a woman he offered a ride to while claiming to be a cab driver in Summit County. Luther went to prison for the attack and was released and then arrested again following the 1993 murder of 20-year-old Cher Elder, who was last seen leaving a casino in Central City, Colorado. Years later, investigators learned that while he was behind bars in 1982, before Annette's body was discovered, he told other inmates that he had killed two young women near Breckenridge and that the authorities would never find the second girl's body. The two lead investigators, P.I. Charlie McCormick and Officer Richard Eaton, verified the inmates' claims. They then flew to West Virginia, where Luther was serving prison time for a separate rape case to question him. He angrily denied any involvement in the women's deaths. He then remarked, they aren't my girls, and reminded the investigators that his weapon of choice was a hammer, not a gun, and they were looking at the wrong man. Also, once his DNA was tested, it did not match the male DNA from Bobby Joe's glove. Beginning in 1999, a task force of five people came together to try to solve the murders and began meeting yearly to discuss updates. Then finally, when forensic genetic genealogy exploded, the DNA profile was used to track down a likely suspect. A genealogist created a family tree of over 12,000 people and narrowed it down to possible offenders in the area around the time of the murders. Finally, one name was given to investigators who then surveilled the man for weeks hoping to get a DNA sample. They were successful and it was a match. On February 24, 2021, 38 years after the murders, Alan Lee Phillips was arrested for the murders of Bobby Joe Oberholzer and Annette Schnee and charged with two counts of first-degree murder, assault, and kidnappings. He was a father of three and had worked as a mechanic and at the time of his arrest was living west of Denver in Clear Creek County. Interestingly, the night he committed the double murders, his truck became stuck in a snowdrift on a mountain pass and he was helped after signaling SOS with his headlights. A passenger in a plane overhead rescued him and questioned why he had taken such a dangerous road in the freezing temperatures. He said he was coming back from a bar and was even interviewed about the incident in a local newspaper. Many believe that although Phillips has no criminal record, he was likely involved in other slayings because it's hard to believe he killed two women hours apart and didn't harm anyone else for the next four decades. Annette's 88-year-old mother and Bobby Joe's husband were relieved to witness an arrest in their loved one's deaths. Cynthia Renee Rogers was described by her mother, Rosia Rogers, as very petite, 
a free spirit, and loved watching birds and taking long walks. At 27, she was a biologist researching Parkinson's disease at the National Institutes of Health on the St. Elizabeth's Hospital campus in Washington, D.C. Cynthia, who was from D.C., was living in Forestville, Maryland at 6401 Pennsylvania Avenue, number 204. On Super Bowl Sunday, January 22, 1989, Cynthia headed to the local market to purchase some items to make soup. On her way there, she decided to take a shortcut and was viciously attacked and murdered. It would be five days before her body was discovered. On January 27, 1989, she was found in the 6,000 block of Surrey Square Lane Service Road in Forestville. She was left on a dirt path littered with trash in an area that locals frequently used as a shortcut to the store less than a mile from her home. She had been beaten and raped before being strangled to death. Sadly, the case would go cold for the next 33 years. A small amount of DNA was collected from her body and preserved. That DNA was used years later in 2018 to exclude several suspects. However, there wasn't a strong enough sample to submit to CODIS. Then in 2020, Prince George County won a grant for almost half a million dollars. The money would be used for costly DNA tests in hopes of solving cases dating back to 1979, and the county has an abundance of unsolved cases with DNA on file waiting to be tested. In early 2022, Cynthia's case was chosen for additional testing. A lab was able to produce a complete unidentified male profile. A search of the State of Maryland DNA database resulted in a positive match to 64-year-old James Clinton Cole. According to reports, Cole would have been 32 years old at the time of Cynthia's murder, and there is no reason to believe the two knew each other. Cole was then charged with first-degree murder, first-degree rape, and several additional charges. He had a criminal record and was already in prison when he was identified as her killer. Cole is currently in prison for forcing a 12-year-old girl at knife point into the woods behind Stoddart Middle School in Maryland in 1996. He then sexually assaulted her and left her tied to a tree. Thankfully, she was able to escape, but it changed her life forever. It would take 14 long years before DNA could identify Cole in that case. He was then charged and sentenced to two life sentences. He will likely perish behind bars where he remains in Cumberland, Maryland. Thankfully, his victim's family can now have closure. Just forget the war for a moment and come with us to South Australia. On December 1, 1948, locals saw what they assumed was a man sleeping off a night of too much drinking on Somerton Park Beach, a seaside suburb of Adelaide, Australia. He was found lying on his back in the sand across from the crippled children's home on the corner of the Esplanade and Bickford Terrace. He was dressed in a perfectly pressed, double-breasted suit and tie, his shoes were freshly shined, and his head rested propped upon the sea wall. His feet were crossed, and he had a cigarette on his collar. Later that morning, the same witnesses noticed that the man had not moved, so a man named John Lyons took a closer look and discovered he was deceased. The post-mortem exam showed signs of some type of poisoning. His spleen was enlarged, his liver was swollen with blood, and blood was found in his stomach. In other words, he was bleeding internally but there were no signs of injury on the outside of the body. He had last eaten a pasty a few hours before his death that could have been poisoned. However, many tests were done to prove this theory, but no trace of any known poisons was detected. Police made a plaster cast bust of the John Doe in hopes of future identification. Blood pooling to the back of his head 
proved that it had been in that position for many hours after his death, possibly since 2 a.m. the morning of his discovery. According to the pathologist John Burton Cleland, the man was of Britisher appearance and thought to be aged between 40 and 45 years old. Also, he was found to be in top physical condition. Found inside his pockets was an unused second-class rail ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach. There was also a bus ticket from the city that may not have been used, a comb that had been manufactured in the USA, a pack of juicy fruit chewing gum, an Army Club cigarette packet that contained seven cigarettes of different brands, and a quarter-full box of Bryant and May matches. All labels on his clothes had been removed, and he had no wallet or hat, which was unusual for 1948. He was clean-shaven, and police initially believed that he had committed suicide. In an attempt to identify the person, investigators checked for dental records, but a match could not be found, and he became known as the Somerton Man or the Unknown Man. Witnesses said the night before, they had seen an individual resembling the dead man lying on his back in the same spot where the corpse was later found. A couple who saw him at around 7 p.m. noted that they saw him extend his right arm to its fullest extent and then drop it limply. Another couple who saw him from 7.30 p.m. to 8 p.m., during which time the streetlights had come on, recounted that they did not see him move during the half an hour in which he was in view. However, they did acknowledge that it was odd he was not reacting to the mosquitoes, but nevertheless, they thought he was more than likely drunk or asleep, so they went about their way. Another witness came forward in 1959 and reported to the police that he had seen a well-dressed man carrying another man on his shoulders along Somerton Park Beach the night before the body was found. On the same day of the discovery, the advisor reported the discovery of the body, giving his identification as possibly being E.C. Johnson of Arthur Street, Paynham. The next day, Johnson arrived at the police station and cleared up the misidentification. By early February 1949, there had been eight different positive identifications of the body, which were all later proven false. Four months after his discovery, a piece of paper was found tucked into a fob pocket of his trousers. It was a small piece of paper torn from the final page of a copy of the poem titled Rubaiyat, authored by 11th and 12th century Persian poet Omar Khayyam and translated in 1859 by Edward Fitzgerald, a popular book at the time. The torn paper contained the Persian phrase Tamam Shud, meaning is over or is finished. This led to the mysterious case being known as the Tamam Shud case. Months later, the book from which the page had been torn was located. A doctor came forward and said it had been thrown into his car parked near the same beach where the man had been found. He said he often left the windows of his car open and thought little of it until he read about the search for the book in the paper. To add to the mystery, on the inside back cover was a local telephone number, another unidentified number, and text that resembled a coded message that still hasn't officially been decoded. The phone number X3239 turned out to be that of a nurse in training named Jessica Ellen Thompson. She lived at 90A Glenelg Street, just 200 yards from where he was discovered. Also, she reportedly worked at the Home for Crippled Children, located in front of where the body was found. Much of the case would become centered around Joe Jessica Thompson. When interviewed, she denied knowing the man and was very evasive. When shown the cast of his face by police, she appeared shocked and looked away and wouldn't look back. She stated that she had given a copy of the Rubaiyat to Alfred Boxall, an Australian Army lieutenant who she had met at the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney in 1944. She reportedly gave him the copy over drinks at the hotel prior to him going overseas to serve in World War II. Boxall was tracked down the next day and was very much alive, and his copy of the Book of Poetry was intact. 
While being questioned, she requested that her real name be withheld because she didn't want her husband to know she knew Alf Boxall. But it turns out that she was not yet married to Prosper Thompson. She and Thompson didn't marry until May 1950, a year and a half later, because he had to wait for his divorce from his wife, Queenie, to be final. Jessica had given birth to a son named Robin Thompson out of wedlock in July 1947. She gave him the surname Thompson because she was unmarried and because of the stigma of an unmarried woman having a child. She had to leave her nurse training at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney due to the pregnancy. It became suspected that Robin was the biological son of either the Somerton man or Alfred Boxall and passed off as Prosper Thompson's son. After being tediously analyzed, it was suggested that the code found on the piece of paper in his pocket was more than likely an acrostic rather than a cipher. This is because its letter frequencies differed considerably from letters written down randomly. The format of the code also appeared to follow the quatrain format of the Rubaiyat, supporting the theory that the code was a one-time pad encryption algorithm. This was one of the reasons many were led to believe that he was a Cold War era spy. Unable to determine his identity, he would go unidentified for the next 74 years. His case has baffled professional and amateur detectives around the world since 1948. Six weeks after the man's discovery, a suitcase containing his property was retrieved from Adelaide Railway Station's cloakroom. It had been checked in at around 11 a.m. the day before his death and included a dressing gown, slippers, underpants, shaving supplies, pajamas, trousers with sand in the cuffs, and some tools and instruments. You could say the tools could be used for hot wiring vehicles and breaking and entering, but no evidence points to him being a criminal. However, apart from three items marked Keen, K-E-A-N, Keen, K-E-A-N-E, and T. Keen, nothing indicating the man's identity was found in those belongings. Also, nobody with that name was reported missing. There was also a Barber brand thread card that wasn't available in Australia. It was orange and had been used to repair the lining in his trousers pocket. Forensic VR specialist Daniel Voschart created his visual representation of the Somerton man. The man's fingerprints and photographs were sent worldwide and a letter signed by FBI Director John Edgar Hoover confirmed the U.S. had found no match for his fingerprints in its files. Jessica Thompson, the nurse questioned by police regarding the Rubaiyat she had given away, later died in 2007. However, six years later, her daughter, Kate Thompson, was interviewed for the Australian 60 Minutes Current Affairs TV program. Kate revealed that her mother had a dark side. Kate said her mother had told her that she indeed did know more about the Somerton man, but had deliberately not revealed it to the police. Jessica told her it was a mystery that was only known to a level higher than the police force. She also revealed that her mother could speak Russian, which suggested that she may have been involved in some spy-related activity. She also taught English to migrants and was interested in communism. Kate said she always wondered if her mother was responsible for the man's death. It was also of note that the copy of the book Jessica had given away had been signed with the name Justin. Her daughter Kate said that some of her nursing pals all those decades earlier called her Tina. Christmas cards sent to her in her later years from her nursing pals said Dear Tina, T-I-N-A, or Dear Tina, T-Y-N-A. Her mother explained this as Jess together with Tina and you have Justin. On May 19, 2021, after years of denied requests to do so, the body was exhumed for DNA collection. A hair trapped in his death mask made of plaster was used to create a DNA profile. This profile was used for genetic genealogy research performed by Australian researcher and Adelaide University physicist Professor Derek Abbott, along with renowned American genealogist Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick. 
Abbott began investigating the identity of the Somerton man over a decade ago with his conscripted students at the University of Adelaide and using the book written about the case by ex-detective Gary Feltis, the cold case investigator. They built a complex family tree of around 4,000 names that finally led to the man's identity, whose date of death had not been recorded. They initially found a first cousin three times removed and matched DNA obtained from his hair to DNA tests taken from his distant relatives. Finally, after 74 years, they determined the Somerton man's identity and announced it on July 26, 2022. They determined that the man was Carl Charles Webb, born November 16, 1905, and the youngest of six. Charles was a 43-year-old electrical engineer and instrument maker from Footscray in Melbourne, Australia. Little is known about his early life, but he married Dorothy Jean Robertson, known as Doff Webb, in October 1941 and abandoned her in April 1947. They had no known children together. Webb had resided in Victoria and had a brother-in-law, Thomas Keene, who lived about 20 minutes away from him, explaining the name on some of the clothes. But four months after applying for a divorce for desertion, she placed an ad for him in Melbourne's Missing Friends section of the Age newspaper. It was a formal notice to make him aware of divorce proceedings, and if he didn't appear on the scheduled court date, the case might proceed in his absence. She was finally granted a divorce in April 1952. Doff Webb applied for divorce nearly three years after his body was found. She said he had suffered several devastating tragedies before disappearing. The documents showed four of his close relatives died within seven years. He lost a brother and nephew in World War II, his father died in 1939, and his mother died in 1946. She stated that he was rude and unpleasant at times, refusing to speak to her, but lived a quiet life, being in bed by 7 p.m. each night. She claimed that one night in January 1946, he told her they were not suited for each other and would be better apart. Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, an expert with Identifinders International, who helped identify the Somerton man, said Mrs. Webb's claims are only half the story. She suspects that Webb had mental health issues and would spiral down. Confirming Webb's name raises many more questions about who he was and how he died. No death record for Webb exists, and his last known records date to April 1947 when he left his wife. She later moved to Butte, South Australia, 89 miles from Adelaide, and he had possibly been trying to track her down. Abbott's research indicates Webb enjoyed betting on horses, thus the coded messages could be horses' names. Webb was also fond of poetry and had written some of his own, explaining the Tamam Should poem. Unfortunately, researchers have not been able to locate any photos of Webb before his death. In 2009, Professor Abbott consulted with dental experts who concluded the Somerton man had a very rare genetic disorder of hypodontia affecting his incisor teeth. University of Adelaide Professor of Anatomy Masha Henneberg assessed photos of his ears and found a feature possessed by only 1-2% to of the population. A photo of Robin showed he shared both these anomalies. Experts say the ears are telling signs of whether two people are related. The chance of coincidence is estimated at between 1 in 10,000 and 1 in 20,000. In addition, both Robin and Webb shared very muscular calves similar to ballet dancers, which Robin was. In 2009, Professor Abbott tried to find Jessica Thompson, whose phone number had come from the mystery man's poetry book. Unfortunately, she died in 2007, and her son Robin died in 2009. Robin turned out to have been a professional ballet dancer whose teeth and ears were said to be remarkably similar to the Somerton man's. However, Abbott eventually found and interviewed that man's daughter, Rachel Egan. 
He first wrote her a letter about her possible relation to the Somerton man, and then the two met at a fancy restaurant in Brisbane. The two then fell in love and got married the following year in 2010. They are now happily married with three children. However, once Rachel's DNA was tested, she was linked to being related to Prosper Thompson, not Carl Webb. She also learned during the process that she was adopted and Robin, who she had never met, was her biological father. Rachel made contact with her biological mother, Roma Egan, and soon moved to Brisbane to be with her. She learned her parents had met when they were both dancers at the Australian Ballet School. Her father, Robin, got a job with the Royal New Zealand Ballet Company, and Roma went with him to New Zealand. Roma then became pregnant, but she and Robin didn't have the means to keep her, so they put her up for adoption. Rachel's mother was suspicious of her relationship with Professor Abbott. Not only did it move very quickly, but she feared he was just out for her DNA or maybe just wanted to bear children with her so they could share the same DNA as the Somerton man that had become his sole focus for many years. This caused the newly introduced mother and daughter to become quickly estranged. While the Somerton man has been identified, his cause of death remains a mystery, one that we will likely never know.